Hello there. We are back. Um, we are on actually our second to the last yeah. video. We are almost done with the book of Titus. And then we don't have to read our Bibles for the whole summer. <laughs> That's not true. Um, I don't normally do um, lead a Bible study in the summer, so I won't be doing anything. Certainly anything like mm. this, even, you know. Um, and what happens in the fall, I don't know. It kind of depends yeah. on on what ha is happening worldwide. And so we'll see, but we'll talk about that next week. So, um, and I hope I remember to do that. Um, but this week we're working on a little tiny section. I think this is the shortest section we've done. Titus 3, 9 through 11, three short verses. Mm -hmm. And I went in this week thinking, um, uh, the, you know, there's not gonna be much there. I'm gonna have to really, really, dig to try to find something to even talk about and it's turned out that that's not true yeah. um i've got some things in mind for us to talk about today that i bet we're going to be pushing our our self-imposed um, time <laughs> limit and um and we're going to have to leave some things out we're just you know there's not enough time to talk about everything i thought that was super interesting yeah um, so what we're going to be doing today, um, we're, as we discuss the, the whole passage, we're going to focus in on a couple of things. Um, we're going to focus in on the church's response to false teachers and false teachings. And we're also going to do just a quick, really quick overview of church discipline, mm -hmm. um, just because it came up and, um, and then, of course, at the end of the video, we will talk about what everybody's going to be doing for this next week. Okay. Last week. Yeah, last one. So let's start with prayer, and then we'll dive in. Father, we just want to give you thanks again for the opportunity to study your word. Um, we thank you just that you have given us your word that we can keep going back to and keep finding new things. I'm, I'm so struck as we've studied through Titus with how we've, we've studied a whole lot of things and yet we could go so much deeper than we've done so far. And, and a lot of it's um, time and a lot of it is schedules and, and all of that that limits our ability to do that. But we know that it's always there waiting for us. And if we pick up this book again, uh, there are going to be more things that we can find. And so just thank you for that and give you praise that that is the nature of your word, that it is a, a live document. And it, um, through the Holy Spirit, it convicts us and it um, just confronts us with truth that is life-changing. And I pray that as we study this morning, that you would lead us and guide us. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, guess what we're going to do next? Oh, we're going to read the passage. Yeah, again. let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. So I noticed when we did our big overview at the very beginning, we spent that first week just looking at the mm -hmm. book as a whole. I remember somebody saying, whoa, what are we going to do with this? Yeah. <laughs> um, does it seem easier now that we're doing it in the context of the book? Yeah, it's not as shocking because when, when you read, especially the part about having nothing more to do with him, you kind of immediately remember back to the first chapter where he's talking about the false teachers and everything, and mm -hmm. it makes more sense why you're having to just, you know, it, Paul talks a lot about rebuking them. and mm -hmm. um, He uses strong words. Yeah. yeah. So it just Insist the on these things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> Taking things in context like that and taking the time to do the background mm -hmm. as we get to that passage, uh, it just makes so much more sense. Um, and that is what he's talking about here. Um, okay, so uh, I think the first thing we need to look at is that very first word, but. Mm -hmm. And 
the reason we need to look at it is because when you see a word like that in the text, you have to respond to it. So when you see that word, but, what's the first thing that it causes you to do? Um, you have to look back to what was just said because the word but implies that it's contrasting something. Or... Exactly, exactly. So what he's just been saying has been how, um, it's, it's, I think it's the insist on these things. Yeah, devoting yourselves to good works. Yeah. Uh, the saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid mm -hmm. foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. So just um, when, you, when you see a word like but... Um, what are some of the other words that, that therefore, therefore, since, mm -hmm. um, because, because sometimes, um, it, you know, I mean, just take a look at those words and see in the flow of the sentence, do they make you go back? Mm -hmm. Do they make you go forward? Do they, you know, um, how can I understand what it is he's saying here? But that's a, that's, those words have flags on them. Yeah. <laughs> Those are flag words. <laughs> um, and I, the other thing about that one is that he is, um, I, because we divided the passage where we did, it was harder to see. But Paul is creating a deliberate contrast mm -hmm. between, okay, verse 8. where he says, uh, those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable mm -hmm. for people. But avoid these other things, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And so he deliberately is using opposite terms mm -hmm. in those two um sentences to contrast and to connect those things yeah yeah um so they are they're both fruit yeah that's true um in galatians chapter 5 where it talks about the fruit of the spirit if you look a few verses before it talks about the fruit of the flesh mm -hmm. um it doesn't say fruit it says mm -hmm. deeds but it's the same thing. Yeah, so interesting contrast. And that's what he's doing here. Um, very similar thing. So, so verse 8, I'm going to sum it up. Verse 8 says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And I'm gonna, verse 9, actually. But... Verse 9, <laughs> yes. Sorry. Thank you for <laughs> catching that. Um so that's why I did it. Um, I'm going to sum it up by saying, don't get sucked in. Mm, yeah. So Dolores mentioned that she talked about how um, we, it's easy to, there's just these yeah. things that we argue about. Um, I've seen people do that within church settings. I've seen people who are, I, I've seen I've seen it in a number of different settings. I remember one time sitting with one of your friends and and she was there was there was a thing, a point of obedience for her, and she didn't want to do what God wanted her to, to do. And so we ended up we talked around it for quite a long time and I finally looked at her because she would say, I'd say, This is this is the thing that God is asking you to do from scripture mm -hmm. and she'd say oh but this thing and oh but that thing and oh but you know and she had and I said you're just building all these fires yeah everywhere else and you're having to pay attention to all those fires but the point is that this is what God is asking you to do and and so she was building fires as a distraction mm -hmm. yeah and, and we do that we do that all the time and that's um it reminded me of that when I read this verse um just getting involved in all of this stuff that doesn't matter and spending well, and time even, arguing about it. You know, Dolores yeah. brought up some yeah. of the um, the issues that within the church we talk about. And some of those issues are good to discuss. Yes. You know, they need to be discussed. We need mm -hmm. to think through them. 
but not in this way, not, yeah. you know, arguments and quarrels. Mm -hmm. and, and then there are the things that you just don't need to even tolerate. That's right. And that's what he's talking about here. The other thing that Dolores noted is that um, when, you're, when you're having a discussion with somebody about those kinds of things, actually listening. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it just that I want to try and convert you to my opinion? Mm -hmm. Or are we actually going to have a dialogue about this? And I think yeah. that was the point that she was getting at. Um, so I, I thought that was good. Have you met Dolores? Yes. Yeah, she's a hoot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, the next thing I want to talk about is in this next verse. He says, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Um, what I want to focus on is, uh, is how the church... And by the church, I also mean individual Christians. Mm -hmm. So as a body and individually, how should we respond to false teaching? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we're going to take a look at that. And in the midst of that, it's going to come up about church discipline. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to hold church discipline until after we do this first one, unless I mess up, in which case we'll do it all at once. Okay, so what we're going to do in order to do this is we've, I've got four different scripture passages that we're going to go to. Um, and I'm going to just tell you the, the scripture passages, and I'm going to tell you what we're going to be looking for, and then we're going to go and read them. Okay, so here they are. <clears throat> the first one is um, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. You might want to just write them down so you've got them. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. 2 John 10, Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, and 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5. I left my Bible over here. <laughs> in fact, when we started to pray, I thought, oh, I don't have my Bible in front of me. I don't know how to pray. Um, okay, so we're going to... I'm going to have you go to that first one, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. Um, and we're, we're going to start there. Um, we're going to be looking for, um, we want to answer some questions like, what is the danger of false teaching? Um, what does the church need to do? What are we told in scripture to do? Um, and why? Uh, what is the goal of addressing the issue of false mm -hmm. teaching? Um, what kind of attitude should we bring mm -hmm. to that process? So the three things that we're looking for, the dangers of false teaching, what we are supposed to be doing about it, and the goal of okay. us doing something about it and the attitude with which we approach it, which I kind of put together. Okay, so if you would go ahead and read Second Thessalonians for us. In chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Okay. Is there anything in there that talks about what the danger of false teaching is? Um, not necessarily. Okay, I agree. Um, how about things that the church and individual Christians ought to be doing? Um, they need to be taking note of that person. Yeah, take note. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anything else in there that is similar to that? Uh, have nothing to do with him. Do not regard him as an enemy. Warn him as a brother. Okay, so the warning to me um, seems okay. like a similar type thing. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're warning the person who's doing the false teaching, but we're also, you know, we're, we're paying attention. Mm -hmm. We're making sure that we are keeping track of what we're being taught. Yeah. Okay. Um, and anything about the goal of how we, you know, when we mm -hmm. address that, the goal or our attitude in it? Um, I don't know if this is what you're going for, but it says that he may be ashamed. Um, Oh, okay. So we're shaming him for what purpose? 
Uh, does it have something to do with the warning him as a brother part? Yeah. Can you can you kind of infer from that? Have nothing to do with him that may be, that he may be ashamed. And then it follows right on its heels. Do not regard him as an enemy. It seems more for the purpose of correction. Uh huh. I agree. I agree. So it's not just shaming for shaming's mm -hmm. sake. And when you read the whole passage there, mm -hmm. the the whole couple of verses, that really I think comes through. Yeah. Um, because he talks about he's not your enemy. Um, mourn him as mm -hmm. a brother. So you're not saying, oh, duh, you know, <laughs> you're you're out. Um, you are <clears throat> treating him as a brother who needs to be mm -hmm. warned and corrected. Taking strong and decisive action, but for not for the purpose of winning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good way to put it. Um, okay, so now we're going to go to Second John ten. We're going to do the same thing. Second John has one chapter this way. We're going to the tenth verse. Um, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, he's talking about the, the regular sound mm -hmm. doctrine, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Mm -hmm. So what's one, is there anything in there about a danger of false teaching? Um, I think kind of back to your concept of getting sucked in, mm -hmm. um, Whoever kind of lets this person in get, takes part in his wicked work. Yeah, I think that's um, a motivation for, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and so what must the church do? Um, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greetings. So um, respond. Yeah. They have to respond to that false teaching. It kind of makes me think back to the Old Testament where um, they're talking about, you know, if there's any other country or tribe or anything that tries to bring in false gods, mm -hmm. um, they take some some pretty strong action, including killing those <laughs> nations. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, just for the purpose of purity of their nation. Yeah. And, well, it's um, an interesting parallel. Yeah. Yeah. We don't murder. No, but... <laughs> But to take it that seriously, I mean, it's obviously a really uh -huh. something that can creep in really easily and, and needs to be dealt with. Keeping the purity of the doctrine yeah. of the church pure. Yeah. Um, okay, it doesn't really talk too much about attitude or, or mm -hmm. um, the goal of it particularly. Next, we're going to go to Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. And I'll go to 1 Timothy 6 while you're doing that. Okay. All right. So Romans 16, 17, and 18. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Hmm. Does it talk about the danger of false teaching? Uh, yeah, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Yeah, that deception. One of these days, I'm going to do a study on the deceitfulness of mm. sin. I've, I've always wanted to do that. I yeah. tuck it back in the back of my mind, but there's a lot in Scripture that talks about being deceived. Mm -hmm. um, and what is the church asked to do in, in this situation? Um, they're supposed to watch out mm -hmm. for those who cause divisions. Um, and I think it's kind of implied that they need to know the doctrine because they have to watch out for these yeah. people who are contrary to the doctrine that they've been taught. Good point. And then to avoid them. Yeah. Um, that's a really good point that if we are going to identify, um, false teaching, we have to know mm -hmm. sound teaching before we can identify what's, what's not sound. Uh, so that's an important part that that individuals in the churches uh, in the church need to do. And does it talk anything about the goal of addressing that? Um, not that's jumping out to me right away. No, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, and then we're going to go to First Timothy six verses three through five. By the way, how did I find all these verses? 
um, I just went in my study Bible and I looked up um, the cross references okay. that um, on this verse in Titus where it talks about avoiding that person. Mm -hmm. um, I followed those cross references. They led me to other scripture. I followed cross references from those, okay. and and this is kind of what came up. Um, and then I so I I put them all down on one piece of paper, and I I looked at them as a totality and said, what in general do they say? Mm -hmm. And that's how I came up with these questions. Okay. So First um, Timothy six three through five. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth imagining that godliness is a means of gain that's a super interesting yeah. verse so we've got some of the dangers of false teaching because it leads to mm -hmm. it, it, the the controversy and quarrels about words which produce envy dissension slander evil suspicions constant friction um, those are some of the dangers just in terms of fruit yeah i think it's interesting that it says an unhealthy craving for controversy because that's those kinds of discussions yeah that's where they go yeah and i think some people brought up this week um not necessarily about this particular concept but just the self-centeredness of a lot of this that it's and we've seen before in titus it's you know for personal gain and yeah um, it's interesting how it if you don't have your eyes on God, it just immediately goes right here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. And even if you do, sometimes yeah. they, it immediately goes right there. Um, it's a thing we have to fight. Um, looking for my other questions here. Mm -hmm. What must we do? Um, it does, doesn't really deal with that. It just says if anyone teaches. Yeah. In the, in the verse right before it, it says, teach and urge these things, yeah. which I would have to go back before. and But I, I assume it means kind of like Titus says, to insist on sound doctrine. Yeah. So, um, so in general, here's what we can say. Um, it's important for us as a church to notice, to watch out, to pay attention mm -hmm. Um, so that we can identify false teaching, um, division, that kind of thing. So we are, we are supposed to be on guard for that. Mm -hmm. And we've already talked about the fact that if we're going to do that, we have to have done our own preparation um, in terms of knowing scripture. Um, and then in general, again, another thing I think we see from these verses is that false teachers and false teachings have to be addressed within the mm -hmm. church. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, and, and ignore it. It really does have to be um, addressed. And if people who are engaging in false teaching are are if they refuse to stop then something serious has yeah. to be done mm -hmm. in order to stop that from spreading um, because if they are allowed to continue those of us who allow them to continue become implicit mm -hmm. in their sin that's it's like we're supporting yeah. them okay i think sometimes we're um I have to kind of make some different connections in my mind is when I picture that discipline being done, it's, it, there's maybe some anger or division involved mm -hmm. and, you know, seeing those verses where it talks about treating him as a brother yeah. um, and not necessarily always as a bleeding brother, but, mm -hmm. but also out of a place of love. Um, I think you have yeah. to kind of remember that. That is an excellent segue into...
um, a discussion of church discipline. Mm. Because, well, you'll see why as we go through. Um, okay, so the one passage that came up when I followed all those cross-references that we haven't really looked at yet, and I saved it for a reason, and you'll see why when we read it, is Matthew 18, 15 through 20. And this is kind of the classic uh, church discipline it's passage. The, the recipe. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Um, Matthew 18, I went to 15. <laughs> Matthew 18, 15 through 20. <clears throat> if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two, to, two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Um, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So one of the things that you see there is that verse that is so often pulled out mm -hmm. of context. You know, if two or three are gathered, I will do, you know, mm -hmm. I'll be there with them. And, and all, if you agree, I will do whatever you ask. Well, that's all in the context of discipline, mm -hmm. church discipline. Um, so this one, all those other scriptures that we read talked about church discipline in terms of false teaching. Mm -hmm. This one is not specific mm -hmm. to false teaching. Okay, if your brother sins against you, yeah. that's kind of vague. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. And sometimes I think my brother sinned against me when really it's just mm -hmm. my own bad attitude. So, um, so this one to me is a little more, you know, sticky. Mm -hmm. um, so this passage forms the basis of the process of church discipline. And the other passages that we read also inform that process. Um, we're not going to do a, an extensive search um, through scripture about church discipline right now. I want to hit a couple of, of overarching mm -hmm. principles of church discipline. The first one is approaching it with an attitude of humility. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's what I was going for earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Before we are ready to confront somebody else about their sin, we have to take the log out mm -hmm. of our own eye, you know, before we take the splinter out of theirs. Mm -hmm. That's a really good scripture to go to before um, confronting somebody else about something is make sure that I'm not guilty of, mm -hmm. you know, sin myself before and we I go have to, to be them. prepared to be dealt with with these same principles. You know, if, if we do sin against our brother, <clears throat> we have to expect that they will come and do this to us, you know, and, and uh, yeah. Be humble in that. yeah, so humility, and that also requires some discernment, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, is it a is it a matter that rises to the level of right. church discipline? So uh, we do we practice church discipline at Skyline. Have you ever seen that happen? Mm -mm. That's because it's being done correctly. Mm -hmm. It should be as much as possible. It should be done privately. Um, usually what happens with church discipline is if somebody is confronted about something, um, they usually see the error of their mm -hmm. ways and they repent or they separate themselves mm -hmm. and, and it's a non-issue. They just don't, they don't continue with the body. So, um, so yeah, it happens on a pretty regular basis. And I only know that because your dad tells me it mm -hmm. does. He doesn't tell me specifics. Of course, I don't want to know, mm -hmm. um, but but we've talked about the topic of church discipline and he says, oh yeah, it happens mm -hmm. all the time, all the time. Um, I think it happens in ways that we often don't think about. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that in just a second. But if you are in a church that practices church discipline, one of the things that you have to do is you have to trust the leaders mm -hmm. of your church, the elders and you know pastors, mm -hmm. That, that they are using discernment yeah. and um, 
that they are being careful to do that church mm -hmm. discipline correctly. Yeah. Um, and that they also know their doctrine and can differentiate when it's something that needs to be dealt yeah. with in the church. We've had um, some issues that have come up just because of being in a position of leadership myself. Um, some things that have come up where I can't even describe all the things, the, the things, and they're, they, they're varied. But uh, somebody will come and say, well, you know, maybe so-and-so is teaching something that mm -hmm. is um, way out of line, or this person is doing, I don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, somebody needs to address yes. it. That, that happens occasionally. And, um, and I always tell people that you, you take something that you think rises to that level to your church leaders and you put it there and then you walk away from it. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to trust them that they are using discernment and being careful um, to follow scripture mm -hmm. in their response. And you, you hopefully will never even see what they do mm -hmm. um, and you have to trust that and yeah. sometimes they choose not to do anything mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have to come back and report to you what they've done yeah you know? I mean there's I think a responsibility to make sure that the leaders are you know following the the correct instruction um, mm -hmm. so just noticing if there is further false teaching that is going on and things yeah. like that but but yeah um, you know if if you do have leadership you can trust and they have good accountability, I think you can just give that to them. And, and doesn't that take us back to the first chapter of the book of Titus? Yeah. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed mm -hmm. you. And here's the list of qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, so we should have leaders within our churches that... Um, that yeah. meet those qualifications yeah. and um, really kind of changes how you read that list it's not just a list of okay now you qualify for the job it's mm -hmm. there's some pretty serious reasons why they have to meet those yeah so those those men should be chosen very very carefully um here's another principle so first one was humility the second one was trusting the leadership of your church um to be discerning and the third one is that church discipline in scripture is always intended to be restorative, mm -hmm. not punitive. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is a, a short chapter. And it talks about a time when church discipline was needing to be applied. And if, if you're familiar with 2 Corinthians you will immediately recognize this situation because you'll you'll recognize that it was applied and it was mm -hmm. effective. And then Paul had to step in and say, stop punishing mm -hmm. him. Okay. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, he says, um, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality of you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And, um, uh, okay, and then I'm going to read these next couple of verses too because they're very pertinent to this. For though I am absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are, this is so mm. over the top. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. I came across that verse while I was doing some cross references and things. And I had to kind of look into some of the concepts in there and understand what he was meaning. Yeah. Um, I think this is the most extreme example in scripture of um, church discipline when he says you are to deliver this man to satan mm -hmm. i mean that's like ah! yeah. and so that sounds punitive mm -hmm. right it sounds like he's punishing mm -hmm. him but why mm -hmm. is that man delivered to satan 
for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So even in that very extreme case, the ultimate goal is restoration. Mm -hmm. And that is always, always God's goal when relationships are broken, when there mm -hmm. are conflicts and I mean, restoration is always the mm -hmm. goal. Um, so when it comes to church discipline, we think of it as punitive. We think mm -hmm. of it as being punishment. And it's really hard to separate. It mind. really <laughs> is. It really is. And, um, and, you know, it happens sometimes that people want church discipline to happen because they want somebody to mm -hmm. suffer. They want them to be shamed. Mm -hmm. They want them to, you know, and that's not what it's about. The mm -hmm. purpose is restoration. Um, I think that's a super important part of yeah. it. Um, and then the fourth overarching principle is going to be what I what I called small acts of church discipline. Mm -hmm. And this is what I referred to before, that there are things that we do that keep us as a church from having to go clear to that place mm -hmm. where we have to start confronting people and, you know, and dealing with all of that. Um, so I would submit that going to church and listening to a sermon is a form of church discipline. Not just listening, but applying that sermon to your life. The self-discipline. <laughs> it is. It is. Does my life conform with the teaching of, mm -hmm. the, of Scripture? Um, and if it doesn't, then I need to correct that. That is a form of church discipline, and we do it every week, I think. Well, and kind of just like the that person you were talking about um, who was trying to address every other issue around the one that mm -hmm. she needed to address. I think we do that with ourselves. It's really easy to look at other people and say, this is your problem. Yeah. But when we look at ourselves, well, this is why I do this, or, you know, this I, that doesn't really apply to me, or you just don't even think about it. True. It's hard to think truthfully about ourselves. <laughs> it really is. It really is. That's one of the deceitfulness yeah. of sin mm -hmm. type things. That That's why I get so intrigued by that, because... It's so hard to even root that out. Mm -hmm. um, so we discipline ourselves by making sure our own lives conform to the teaching. We also monitor the teaching. Mm -hmm. So part of our job on Sunday mornings is to listen to the sermon and evaluate it. Mm -hmm. We don't just suck up everything that we hear. Um, we have to be discerning about what we hear. We need to be going back to scripture and checking it out and making sure mm -hmm. that it's correct. Not just sermons. Um, I sure hope that everybody has been doing that with this Bible study. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I get in there and I, you know, mm -hmm. categorically say something. I try to think about those things pretty thoroughly mm -hmm. ahead of time. But I'm human, yeah. you know? I So I hope that people are evaluating what we're saying and making sure that it is in mm -hmm. line with scripture. Um, you know, we should be doing that all the time. Yeah. Um, and so that monitoring what we are being taught, monitoring our own lives. I think that's um, important part mm -hmm. of, of church discipline. Yeah, that's true. So um, that's basically what I have about church discipline. Anything else that that brings up? Um, just something that's been rolling around in my head, and I I don't know that I'll have words to say it real well, but um, someone in one of their emails talked about, um, brought up the word heresy. It was in relation to one of the words they looked up, and it was kind of one of the, the further definitions of it. Um, and I can't remember exactly what they were saying, but the, um, the thought that I kind of came away with was that, you know, there, there are even churches in our communities that are accepting things that are not biblical teaching um mm -hmm. it was something about um accepting one's own opinion as like choosing choosing one's own opinion as the truth rather uh, than the actual biblical teaching. yes i remember that thought. and it was just mm -hmm. the fact that it was connected to the word heresy it was mm -hmm. like wow that's a, a really serious thing i mean there's 
there's without getting into politics and everything there's churches that accept things or teach things in our communities that are not according to scripture and mm-hmm. um and that's heresy <laughs> yeah. and i i do that in my own life i make allowances for myself or for other people and um just to see that as gravely as sin and, and heresy is yeah. I think, important yeah i agree um it's kind of a big deal mm-hmm. um yeah so that's not a an in-depth look at church discipline by any means but um, I, for me, one of the big things about church discipline is just understanding that it's not punitive. Mm-hmm. The humility with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's take a look at what we're going to be doing um, in this next week. All right. Next week is the very last passage. You might think there's nothing there. <laughs> I was just going to say, there's nothing there. It's just a... You know, there's a lot of things that you could do. Um, you could, there's a lot of people mentioned. I just started by making a list of everybody who was mentioned, and I have a long list. Um, there's a, a place that's mentioned. Those things might be interesting to look mm-hmm. a little bit and see if you can find anything about them, any of them. Um, I also would challenge you to find the typo, because <laughs> there is a typo in there. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I also wanted to point out, let me make sure I'm not missing something. Okay, you're going to be working on, by the way, pages 81 through 87, which is the very end of the book. Um, But on page 85, I did some questions. This is all the space you get. (laughs) Not lots of boxes this time, just because. And, And what was funny is I have started on next week's stuff, and I was like, I like my little boxes. I'm not sure how I'm going to use that. Um, We're going to do a little bit of review of the entire book on page 85. Um, There is, uh, in the second question, I ask, what are the major themes in the book? And you might not know what themes are. But like today, we talked a lot about false teaching. Yeah, that's that's one of the themes of the book of Titus. So another way of saying themes would be topics. Mm-hmm. Um, so just anything that you think the book talks about in general um, is probably a theme in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, it took me such a long time to figure that out. I would look, you know, if you look in your study Bible, it'll say yeah. themes in the book of, and I, I don't know how they get that stuff. Well, I, practice mm-hmm. um, and you know and just kind of starting to see the bigger picture and here's what they're talking about in general in this section here's what they're talking about here um, has helped me to be able to spot themes mm-hmm. um, your answers do not have to min- to match mm-hmm. what's in your study Bible um, they don't have to be worded the same and they don't have to necessarily be the same so um, so that's what we're going to be doing this next week. And um, anything else we ought to add before we're done? I think that covers it. Okay. All right. Well, we will see you all 